I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we have done and are in the process of doing in the um, pairs of uh, three-spine stickleback that we have in lakes in British Columbia. And uh, here's sort of a, a rough outline of the talk. I'll introduce the stickleback um, briefly, describe uh, what we know or how we know that uh, natural selection was likely important in the uh, evolution of reproductive isolation between these forms. And then I want to talk about some recent work that we're carrying out that looks at the genetics of reproductive isolation, work that's in uh, collaboration with Katie Peichel, uh, uh, among others. <clears throat> so it starts with uh, Darwin's great book, my, my vote for, um, I don't know, book of the last millennium. Um, <clears throat> it did um, many things, you know, page one. The origin of species is declared as that uh, mystery of mysteries, but one thing that this uh, magnificent book did not do was really establish whether species originated by means of natural selection. And uh, the reason we say that is partly because we look back and recognize that Darwin's concept of species was not the same as ours, and that our concept has changed through time. I look at the term species as one arbitrarily given for the sake of con convenience to a set of individuals closely resembling each other. So his definition of species was phenotypic. And uh, Darwin appreciated that crosses between species often produced sterile offspring, but he didn't think that um, sterility or inviability was reliable enough and so preferred a, um, a morphological definition. And uh, in, in Darwin's world, then, speciation is the evolution of sufficiently many phenotypic differences that a taxonomist would describe them as separate species. And then showing that natural selection is involved in speciation amounts to showing that natural selection is involved in phenotypic differentiation. And uh, that's what Darwin's book is all about. And uh, one of my favorite papers, sort of, of this um, period of our um, um, research into the origin of species comes from uh, work by Carl Hubbs. And uh, this was a, a chapter that was published in the American Naturalist, which was the proceedings of the last major conference on speciation before the biological species concept. <clears throat> and it's a crazy publication because everybody's using a different definition of species already. <clears throat> and, uh, but he pointed out something pretty interesting, and um, that was he, he recognized that repeatedly in groups of uh, fishes, he focused on uh, lampreys in this paper, that um, uh, particular phenotypes and life histories, in this case stream forms of lampreys, had evolved uh, a, a non-parasitic lifestyle and had done so repeatedly in association always with this transition to um, life in small streams. And he concluded from this repetition, which I'm going to call sort of the, the parallel evolution test, that um, speciation must be caused by natural selection. But of course he's just referring to the evolution of <coughs> um, phenotypes. Nevertheless, this uh, idea is one that uh, we have made uh, use of. Already by 1937, um, Dobzhansky had defined what speciation really was. He's not known for uh, defining the biological species concept, but it's pretty clear that speciation, in his view, <coughs> was the evolution of um, reproductive isolation. And the biological species concept um, was published in 1942, and from this point on, um, the study of speciation became the study of the evolution of reproductive isolation. So humans and chimpanzees are considered separate species not just because we look different or may have uh, uh, genetic differences that distinguish us. What matters is that when it comes time to reproduction, either we find one another repulsive or that uh, when um, if, uh, um, hybridization does occur, presumably, uh, sterility or inviability would result. <coughs> Actually, it was a, a rogue Russian scientist in the 1920s who attempted this experiment <coughs> three times. <laughs> <coughs> Dobzhansky also gave us a picture of how reproductive isolation evolved, a sort of uh, a simple genetic model. And it began with the idea that two populations uh, would um, in the beginning be genetically similar to one another and through a process of uh, mutation and either selection or drift, I'm focusing on selection here, 
that they would accumulate genetic differences. So in this cartoon, population A acquires the, the change little a to big A, population 2, little b to big B, and as a result of genetic differences, either um, mating would not take place or that there would be something wrong with uh, the hybrids. And uh, <coughs> there are two ways in which such genetic differences can accumulate between populations like this. And uh, one of them is uh, what we've called ecological speciation. It's just simply that these populations occur in contrasting environments, and big A is favored in this environment, and big B is favored in the other environment. It's not the only means by which natural selection can produce genetic differentiation leading to speciation. This other um, mechanism that uh, Manny and Clark called a mutation order or mutational order, not with reference to speciation, but simply with, result, uh, with, with respect to um, uh, genetic evolution, is the idea that since populations are finite, they will not experience the same mutations. And even if they did experience the same advantageous mutations, the probability that those mutations would be lost is so high that effectively chance rules <coughs> um, a, a, a great deal. And even though A, big A might be favored if it had occurred in this environment, uh, either it never occurred or uh, by chance went extinct before it rose in frequency. So these I think of as alternative ways in which um, natural selection might produce the reproductive isolation. And um, I've always been interested in the one on the right-hand side, principally because it's uh, much easier to test. So um, <coughs> I started working on uh, stickleback when I moved to Vancouver. I learned about these, uh, these amazing populations. And uh, at the time, I was looking for a system in which it would be possible to do um, experimental studies, that being very difficult with Darwin's finches. And uh, to understand uh, what has happened, one needs to start with the uh, Ice Age. So uh, 10,000 years ago, the area where I work was, uh, or 13,000 years ago, the area where I work was covered by ice about one and a half kilometers thick. The ice melted fairly rapidly over a period around 150, uh, sorry, um, a period of around 1,000 to 2,000 years. And uh, after the ice was melted, the weight of that ice had been so great that coastal lands had been basically pushed down into the sea. And uh, sea levels were about 150 meters higher then than they are today. But with the weight of the ice gone, the land slowly rebounded. <laughs> and as it did so, it formed um, many, many small um, coastal lakes. And uh, this is one very typical one. And what's interesting about uh, these small coastal lakes is they contain three spine stickleback. And uh, there's a few lakes, such as this one, Paxton Lake, on uh, Texada Island in British Columbia, which contain not one, but two species of three-spine stickleback. And uh, one of the things that drew my attention to this group was the fact that, actually, there are a number of lakes that contain two species of three-spine stickleback. And even in the early days, when Don McPhail uh, was studying these, there was an uh, indication that they might have um, independent origins. And uh, that's the, the, the great thing about working on these fish is that speciation has happened not once but multiple times, and uh, this would provide us with opportunities to um, try and determine what the mechanism underlying it. So these species are all found in a, a few lakes in the Strait of Georgia, which is between Vancouver Island and uh, the mainland of um, southwestern British Columbia. Two of the five species pairs are already extinct. So they're among the most highly endangered fishes in uh, Canada, which is making life actually very difficult for us now that we continue to work on them. So the molecular evidence that has accumulated over time suggests that the pairs have um, originated m multiple times. And uh, this is um, a microsatellite phylogeny, which illustrates um, that uh, actually the phylogeny is pretty poorly resolved. These are bootstrap support values, and, uh, and uh, they're really not that impressive. But it is possible, or it was possible with the microsatellite data, at least to rule out um, two possibilities. And one is that each ecotype originated only once. And the other was that within a lake, each was the other's uh, sister species. So the uh, species pairs seem to have originated by some form of um, multiple invasion details still. Um, unclear. <laughs>
So um, the SNP array that Felicity and Frank and uh, others in the Kingsley lab put out um, was used again to look at um, genetic relationships among the um, limnetic and benthic um, species within these pairs. And uh, the, the, the picture is still challenging, um, but nevertheless interesting. So um, these are uh, hundreds and hundreds of um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And uh, if you take the frequency data of alleles at these um, various SNPs and toss them into a principal component analysis, the first axis, the major <coughs> axis of differentiation among the limnetic and benthic populations groups them by lake. So here's the Paxton Lake species pair. This is principal component one. The Priest Lake species pair and the Little Cory Lake species pair. <coughs> suggesting that they have independent origins. However, the second, and not far behind, uh, principal component um, groups them by ecotype. So if these forms have originated multiple times, it's very likely that they have repeatedly used the same genes, or at least frequently enough, to um, produce a pattern such as this one. The forms are ecologically um, very different, and it's always been an interest as to whether reproductive isolation is in any way connected to the um, the evolution of these ecological differences. So the limnetic species um, in the non-breeding season is out in the open water feeding on zooplankton. And I've drawn a little uh, um, photograph here of a calanoid copepod, which are highly evasive zooplankton. If you ever um, do foraging experiments in, in, in tanks and watch the limnetics feed on these zooplankton, the, the zooplankton are unbelievable. They seem to vaporize and then reappear a couple of centimeters away. They're very fast, and uh, so are the stickleback. <coughs> the benthic species feeds more on um, macroinvertebrates in the littoral zone. It's possible to train a benthic to feed on calanoid copepods. And how it learns to actually to do so, lacking the speed is of, of the limnetic, is that it traps them in the corners of the fish tank. Um, one of the ways in which we can distinguish these two um, lifestyles in the species pairs is using stable isotopes. So this is a a tool, a technique that's used frequently in freshwater biology. Um, because of the, uh, the ratio of different um, uh, isotopes of carbon and nitrogen tell us something about these ecological differences. And I want you to sort of remember the orientation of these differences between the limnetics and the benthics. So the benthic species has, um, for the, 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 the way in which the isotope ratios are usually computed, the benthic has high values of carbon and low values of nitrogen indicating that ultimately the carbon is derived from the littoral zone. Whereas the limitic species has low carbon, indicating a pelagic source of carbon, and also a higher uh, nitrogen value, which indicates a higher trophic level. And that's because these copepods are actually predatory. So limitics feed at a slightly higher trophic level on average than benthics. So I'm going to show you this figure again later, because it will uh, become important in some of the experimental work I'll describe shortly. All kinds of morphological differences between the forms along the brachial arches. Uh, there are these filaments, uh, these projections called gill rakers. Generally, they're long and numerous in zooplanktivorous fishes, fewer and stubbier in um, fishes that are not zooplanktivorous, and that pattern is repeated in our limitics and benthics. A whole variety of body shape differences. The limitic jaw is further turned up. It has a much larger fin area near the back of the body. The benthic has this sort of humpbacked shape uh, the position of a maximum body depth is, is forward, the uh, fins are uh, reduced, and uh, so on. These morphological differences appear to result in very different feeding efficiencies. We can take them into the lab and simulate open water and littoral zone uh, environments, and uh, there's about a twofold advantage. Each species has approximately a twofold advantage in its preferred uh, environment, and this translates into approximately twofold advant uh, uh, advantage in <coughs> reciprocal transplant experiments in uh, enclosures placed out in the, the lakes. Um, also, there's evidence of um, interactions between the species, and this was actually one of the first things that drew my attention to this group. When um, two species are present, they're ecologically more differentiated than any two uh, single species populations picked at random. In general, similar lakes, lakes of similar relatively small size, the stickleback in them tend to be intermediate in morphology and uh, also in their feeding ecology. And uh, we've done 
pond experiments to show that when one species is added to the environment of the other, uh, competition falls disproportionately heavily upon those phenotypes in the other population which are most similar to the added competitor and that competition between them favors divergence. Uh, recently, Richard Svanbeck uh, and I published a paper showing that there's also differences in phenotypic plasticity between the forms. Generally, the limitics and benthics, which are um, ecologically more specialized than the single species solitary populations, have lower phenotypic plasticity and overall shape than the solitary populations. And this makes a contribution to the difference, uh, differing amounts of phenotypic variation uh, in morphology that uh, is found in these populations. So I'm not going to go into great detail uh, about all of the ways in which we've attempted to test this idea that adaptation to contrasting environments has brought about and played a role in the evolution of reproductive <coughs> isolation between these forms. Um, I'll quickly review two of the sources of evidence that we have um, used. And one of them is uh, related to the one that I described uh, uh, that Carl Hubbs used for lampreys. And the other is to um, present uh, or to summarize evidence that, uh, <coughs> that the fitness of hybrids has an ecological basis. So if these species have arisen in parallel, as the, um, the molecular data suggest, then it's possible to carry out this sort of parallel evolution test, but this time not with life history or phenotype. We've done that too, but for reproductive isolation itself. And so we've done a, a large series of experiments in the, uh, in the past in which we would take, <laughs> say, a female from <coughs> one of the species pairs, in this case a benthic from Paxton Lake, and present her with either a male of um, the limnetic form or of the benthic form from another lake and ask which uh, will she mate most readily. And uh, again, this is um, work that Howard did a number of years ago. And the basic pattern uh, is as follows. Generally, when a female of one particular form is provided with um, males either of the same form or a different form from another lake, she will mate much more readily with the same form, even though it's from an another lake and uh, 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 has evolved independently. And uh, in general, it doesn't actually matter that much whether the form comes from the same lake or from different lakes. The, pre the probability of mating is approximately the same. Whereas if you take a limetic from one lake and a benthic from another lake, the probability of their uh, spawning is, uh, is much lower, and it's nearly as low as when the two forms come from the same lake. So whatever it is that causes one individual to, to um, mate or not mate with another uh, individual, those mechanisms have evolved in parallel as well. So only natural selection, as, as Hubs recognized, only natural selection can produce that pattern. But of course, there are many details uh, left unanswered. <coughs> a second body of work that was uh, started by Todd Hatfield in my lab was to investigate um, the, the basis of uh, fitness of hybrids. And uh, what we observed is that when we raise hybrids in the lab, their fitness is just as high as the parental forms. But when F1 hybrids are transplanted to the wild in these um, uh, enclosure experiments, that basically they're worse than the benthic in the benthic's environment, and they're worse than the limitic in the limitic environment. And um, <coughs> now this, has th 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 this could be because of an ecological mechanism, or it might just be that hybrids are terrible and that the, the field is more stressful than the lab, and it's only in the field that these kinds of uh, results are manifested. I can tell you that's wrong, because my lab is way more stressful than Paxton Lake. But anyway, <laughs> it's possible to test that idea by asking, well, the F2s should have a similar on average, their phenotype is the same as the F1s. They should have a similar uh, reduction in fitness, whereas the back crosses, being more similar to the parental species, should actually have higher fitness in the field. And Howard Rendell did those experiments to show that that prediction was met. So as I said, many details left unanswered. And so over the last few years, we've been scratching our heads going, how do we take <coughs> this further? How do we understand just exactly how selection on phenotypic traits has brought about the genetic changes that underlie reproductive isolation. And one way in which we're exploring this is to actually make some progress in uh, identifying 
the genes, or at least the properties of genes that underlie reproductive isolation, in the hopes that it will provide us with some answers to these questions. So we've begun a search for the genetic basis of reproductive isolation. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to um, describe uh, a couple of projects that we've done. Um, <coughs> this work is um, primarily being led by um, a couple of people, Matt Arnegard, who was a postdoc in my lab, now in Katie Peichel's lab, and Gina Conti, a, um, a PhD student in my lab. And uh, it's a collaboration between the Peichel lab and the Schluter lab. And that work is carried out in uh, an experimental pond facility that we built recently on um, the UBC campus. This is Pond 2.0. So this is uh, uh, an image from Google Maps, so you can take a tour of the ponds yourself. And um <coughs> what uh, e each of the ponds is um, rectangular, 25 meters long, uh, 15 meters wide, and uh, 6 meters deep at one end. And that's the, the darker area. So they have a a sort of a shallow slope littoral zone and then a, a precipitous drop to a, a deep water zone of six meters. And the idea behind uh, the experiment was that if we did it in the ponds, we would allow the development of natural uh, uh, behaviors and uh, their expression in the context of these experiments. So there's a, a scene from the side. Here's the outline of the talk again. <coughs> just to show you where we are. So I've summarized uh, the, the, the system, talked a little bit about the kind of evidence that we have um, explored that uh, suggests that natural selection played an important role in the evolution of these pairs. And uh, I'm going to talk uh, uh, for the rest of this talk on uh, some of our results and some of our work in progress on the genetics. So a hallmark of ecological speciation in general is that uh, there, is, there are um, ecological selection pressures against the hybrids. And uh, we call this extrinsic or environment-dependent reproductive isolation. And uh, in this particular project, we were exploring post-zygotic isolation, namely the fitness of hybrids once produced. And uh, one of the questions we were interested in is whether post-zygotic isolation that results from an ecological mechanism uh, is the same or different from intrinsic post-zygotic isolation. And the basic model that's used to describe intrinsic um, post-zygotic isolation is the so-called Dobzhansky-Miller uh, Miller, um, model. And uh, as far as I know, from all of the genetics work that's been done on the, um, the genetic basis of intrinsic post-zygotic isolation, the dobzhansky miller model has been supported every time. And uh, again, it's the cartoon that I showed you from um, Dobzhansky, but I'm going to focus on a, a much more specific mechanism. Two um, populations begin initially uh, genetically the same, and uh, in one population, uh, a different genetic change occurs than in a second population. Little a to big A, little b to big B, and something about the, uh, um, the combination uh, big A and big B in the either the F1 or F2 or back cross hybrids uh, produces a genetic uh, interaction that interferes in some way with normal development and causes either inviability or sterility. So that's the classic Dobzhansky Miller model. And um, as I said, as far as I know, it's been supported every single time that intrinsic post isolation has been mapped. But post isolation is thought to evolve slightly differently. The idea behind um, ecological speciation is that populations adapt to contrasting environments. And as they accumulate more and more adaptations between those environments, the fitness of hybrids becomes, relative to the parentals, worse and worse. Effectively, hybrids fall between the peaks of the adaptive landscape. So here are two populations that are adapting to uh, different features of the uh, environment. And uh, as they become better and better adapted to those features of environments, hybrids, when produced, basically fall deeper and deeper into the valley, and that this is um, the reason that their fitness is low. Now, I should say that ecological speciation can uh, result in the evolution of these intrinsic genetic incompatibilities. 
But for the time being, I'm not focusing on that. I want to focus on the extrinsic component of post-psychotic isolation. <laughs> and uh, this is sort of our, our picture of how extrinsic post-psychotic isolation occurs. It, hybrids suffer uh, in uh, the wild at because they're intermediate in phenotype. And uh, so this is sort of a, an attempt to superimpose on the, 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 the general Dobzhansky uh, uh, framework what the evolution of extrinsic post-psychotic isolation might look like. It's a very simple model, therefore it's probably wrong, but I wanted to uh, contrast it with the intrinsic, the model of intrinsic um, post-psychotic isolation. Again, two populations that begin genetically similar and end up genetically different, but in this case they end up genetically different because different alleles at different loci are favored in either one environment or the other. So there's a, a mapping of genotype onto um, a, a, a phenotype, and uh, these little red curves indicate that the, the two populations are adapting to different uh, environments, different phenotypes are optimal. And that hybrids, when produced, uh, fall between the adaptive peaks and therefore are selected. So it's not the same kind of interaction between alleles from different parental forms that produces um, a deficiency, a reduced fitness of hybrids in uh, extrinsic post-psychotic isolation. It's not completely additive model, it's only additive-ish, for reasons I can explain later. So to test this idea, we made crosses between limitics and benthics from uh, Pax Paxton Lake. And uh, one of the beautiful things about these ponds is that you don't have to feed the fish. You ra we raise the F1 hybrids to adulthood, and then we throw them into a pond in spring. And then we come back to the pond in autumn, and we haul out, you know, one, two thousand F2 hybrids. And in this experiment, we um, collected like 635 um, F2 hybrids, and then we um, measured stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen so that we could get an idea of what their ecological niches were in the, uh, uh, in the ponds. This is a figure you've already seen. I just want to remind you of the orientation of the benthic uh, uh, type and the limetic <laughs> type. So benthic is lower right, limetic is upper left. And uh, when we genotype, or when we um, um, did the stable isotopes on the uh, F2 hybrids, we found that there was segregation. Um, of stable isotopes and hence of diet. So some, some phenotypes, some F2s were more benthic-like, others were more limetic-like, and uh, then there's this group here, which uh, I'll talk to you about a little bit, but I want to ignore them for the moment. And uh, we <coughs> described a sort of niche score, which is basically this axis, which separates limetic-like from benthic-like phenotypes. And uh, <coughs> um, if we, you look at what was in their stomachs at the time of capture, you find that indeed these limetic-like uh, isotope um, signatures in F2s is associated with uh, more uh, calinoid copepods in the diet, uh, whereas those with a more um, benthic signature had uh, more um, chironomid larvae in the diet. The A group had neither of these things in the diet. I'll tell you about those a little bit later. <coughs> Matt also measured the <coughs> body, body sizes of all these F2s, and uh, if you measure or look at the relationship between body size and isotope signature, you find a saddle-shaped structure where, uh, where the, the two groups having the maximum body size within this population of F2s are those that are either the most limetic-like or the most benthic-like. And this group <coughs> this group here is, is just diving down, plummeting. This is the lowest point on the uh, sort of performance surface, is what we're calling it. So in these ponds, we've generated segregation variance in the, uh, the diets of um, individual F2s, and uh, can also show that we generate the same sort of a, a fitness landscape that we imagine is present in the wild, namely that, that, that the limetic and the uh, benthic extremes represent the uh, the best phenotypes in the lake. <coughs> what is the phenotypic basis of these differences in stable isotope? So I'm going to focus on this niche, sco uh, niche score again. So low niche score means um, uh, limetic-like, high niche score means benthic-like. So if you look at the variation in phenotype among the F2s, you see that 
the more um, benthic-like F2s have fewer gill rakers compared to the limnitics. Uh, whereas the, the benthic uh, F2s have um, a higher suction index, so it's possible to estimate how much suction an, in an individual fish can generate through a series of um, measurements uh, based on models that have been developed in Peter Wainwright's lab. <coughs> and uh, the benthic-like uh, individuals, those individuals that were benthic-like in their stable isotopes and diet, they really suck. <laughs> Benthics are built for suction. Actually, lunatics suck as well, <coughs> but they suck differently, as I'll show you. So, um, <coughs> two features that the limnetic-like phenotypes have that the benthic-like phenotypes do not is um, uh, something called the opening in lever of the lower jaw, and it measures the extent to which uh, basically moving a lever in the lower jaw results in a movement forward of the lower jaw. And uh, simultaneously, uh, the protrusion of the upper jaw. So how, how limnetics feed on calanine copepods is that they, uh, they, they approach, they get within a certain distance of the calanoid copepod and then they throw their mouths at the, um, at the item. They don't actually, uh, you know, so much like wrap the, the mouth around. They get as close as they possibly can and then they, and then they suck. But, but to do that, they form sort of a, a tube and they project that mouth as far forward as possible. That's how limnetics differ from benthics. And, uh, the, uh, 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 a reduced opening lever uh, results in a faster um, jaw throwing and a protrusion basically throws it further. So benthic-like phenotypes suck, uh, but, they do, but their mouth moves more slowly and uh, generates um, um, a greater uh, water flow into the buccal cavity. Uh, limnetics rapidly eject their jaws forward. And uh, these sorts of variations are found in the F2s associated, again, with the diet differences that we see. We also, besides these functional measures, we also measure just a whole pile of shape characteristics. And uh, when we mapped all of these traits uh, associated with niche score, uh, we found that they mapped to 14 chromosomes. This is just an example of chromosome 12, where a variety of things are mapping. The number of long gill rakers, uh, the apaxial muscle, which is the muscle on the back, giving the benthic a sort of humped uh, uh, shape. That's what opens the roof of the jaw and generates so much uh, suction. We can, match, we can map the suction index itself, and then a couple of um, uh, landmarks from the shape analysis. So I won't go into details as to which traits map where, but if you look at all of the traits that influence, uh, that are associated with niche score, map them on the genome, and then basically just count up the number of benthic alleles present, you find that basically the more benthic alleles you have at all of these QTL, the more uh, benthic-like you are in your uh, niche score. And the fewer benthic alleles you have at all these QTL, uh, the in other words, the more limnetic-like alleles you have, the more limnetic-like your diet. And uh, it's almost completely additive, but not completely. And what additivity means is, is that uh, it doesn't actually matter that much which QTL has the benthic alleles. They're essentially interchangeable. That's what additive means. It doesn't make a lot of sense. We're talking about different traits. Surely it cannot be additive. And it's true, there is an epistatic component to this as well. But it's surprising how large the additive component is. But as I said, this is just uh, a, a, a part of the story. It's not the whole story. And uh, to demonstrate that, I want to focus on group A here. What is this group? <coughs> um, so if you actually look at the phenotypes of the, um, the A group, <coughs> you find that in contrast to the L group and the B group, they possess combinations of uh, limnetic-like and benthic-like traits. And uh, the in our interpretation of looking at these traits is that, that it results in a mismatch. Whereas the L group tends to have um, features of the lower and upper jaw that make it easy or make it possible to feed on evasive zooplankton, <coughs> the, this A group <coughs> has a, uh, a limnetic-like 
lower jaw, which means they can throw the jaw forward relatively quickly compared with a benthic, but they don't have um, the jaw protrusion to basically throw the mouth forward. So they can move the mouth fast, but it's not going anywhere. <coughs> and uh, when you look at what's in their uh, stomachs, they're not feeding on limitic type food, copepods. They're not feeding on benthic type food. <coughs> They're feeding on food that just doesn't, you, know, you don't find in the diet in the wild. They're feeding on springtails, columbula, that are landing on the water surface. Is that the only thing that cannot escape? So it's a word group, and we think that uh, the interpretation <coughs> makes, the following interpretation makes sense, that they possess a combination of traits from the benthic and the limetic, and those combinations uh, are unable to make use of the environment efficiently. <coughs> and that means <coughs> that extrinsic isolation also has sort of an analog of intrinsic isolation, and that is that, that epistasis can be generated by combinations of traits. So even if the traits have additive inheritance <coughs> themselves, uh, combinations of traits may be so bad that Essentially, you generate epistasis between their underlying genes. And so this represents a kind of epistasis, but it's only visible in an ecological context. So if you brought all of these phenotypes into the lab, they'd all do fine. <coughs> I don't know how much time I have left, because I can't remember what time I started. <laughs> Ten more minutes, great. <coughs> so this is a project that we're still, uh, we're still carrying out, and I just wanted to tell you about it, because it's so much fun. <coughs> <coughs> so one of the other things we're using the, the ponds for is to look at the genetics of assortative mating. And um, this is the, probably the riskiest part of the whole experiment. And if you never hear from us again, <coughs> uh, it, it means something went wrong along the way. But, but we put so much time into this uh, project that um, I just have to tell you about it. <coughs> so if we, if we go to Paxton Lake and collect uh, males of either the benthic species or the limnaic species and throw them into the ponds, they, they get busy and building nests in these ponds. And um, <coughs> the benthics will hang around the vegetation region just like they do in the wild, and the limnaics will hang around in the water column and nest out in the open just as they do in the wild. So, <coughs> um, again, just to um, give you an idea of the kinds of questions that we're addressing with this. The, the, the major one that we were actually interested in when we set up this experiment was really just to ask whether assortative mating mapped to the same regions of the genome as the traits <coughs> that adapt limetics and benthics to their contrasting ecological environments. And one of the reasons we were interested in this question is because limetics and benthics still um, exchange genes. So there, there is some gene flow between them, and according to Felsenstein, that's not easy to maintain. It's not easy to maintain reproductive isolation between populations that are exchanging genes. And one of the ways in which um, <coughs> forms can persist is if there's linkage between genes involved in assortative mating and those involved in adaptation. <coughs> so I haven't got any results on that, but uh, I just want to show you what we're actually doing. So throw the males in, uh, benthics will nest under, under vegetation, the medics out in the open just uh, as in the wild. <coughs> and so we took this uh, pond, and uh, we throw uh, limetic benthics in, but we also throw in adult F2 hybrid females from one of the other ponds that uh, uh, raised hundreds or uh, even thousands of F2s. So we take some tissue from the, uh, all the fish that go into the pond so we can um, genotype them for a panel of microsatellites. And uh, then uh, we go into the pond and raise, uh, raid the nests of the males. So males stick about care for the young. They build these nests, female drop, females drop their eggs in them, the males fertilize them, and then they take care of the young, uh, of the eggs and uh, even the fry. And so this involves uh, um, putting on a wetsuit and spending hours and hours and hours in the, in, in the ponds, finding as many eggs as you possibly can. <coughs> so here's an example. You know, you dive down, you grab the, grab the nest, <coughs> um, uh, take it apart and see if there's eggs uh, in the nest. In this case, there was. So then we bring the eggs back to the lab and we keep them oxygenated for a few more days 
so that the embryos are large enough that we can get some DNA. And then we do parentage analysis to try and figure out who mated with whom. And ultimately what we would like to be able to do is, is um, map female preference in this way. And uh, it's wonderful to be able to do this in the ponds because um, if you've ever worked on stickleback, you know how hard it is to do a mate choice trial. <laughs> Particularly how hard it is to do a mate choice trial in which the female actually has a choice of males. So here's a situation in which the female actually has a choice of males. She has a choice of a couple of dozen males of each type. <coughs> and uh, so now we're going to try and map that. And uh, the, the only uh, preliminary result that I have, which is from one of three um, ponds uh, in which we did this, is that there's a tendency, it's not a, not a hugely strong tendency, but there's a tendency for those F2 females that are more benthic-like in their uh, overall morphology, <coughs> particularly the skull, they have a higher probability of mating with a benthic male, whereas those F2 females that are more linetic-like in their morphology, their shape, have a slightly higher probability of mating with a linetic male. So this is the first indication that there might actually be an association between uh, some of the phenotypic differences between these forms and, um, and their mate preference. But that's, that's all I've got at the moment. So I just want to end again by um, <coughs> with a, a, a couple of quotes that really um, I guess started us all off with the idea that natural selection might be important in the origin of species. So Dubzhansky, in a paper in Ecology, <coughs> actually suggested that speciation and Drosophila involve adaptation to contrasting environments, and that's why reproductive isolation evolved. But he had no evidence of this. <coughs> One can dig around in Ernst Meyer's writing and find examples where he seems to be saying the same thing. Uh, but again, he had no evidence for this. And uh, you and we are working on a, a number of systems, I think, in which it's possible to make some progress in addressing this question. So we're part way along. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> <coughs> we're gonna